Welcome to Forest Haven, also known as one of the top 10 worst cases of institutional abuse in the United States' history. When I was at Forest Haven, I was in a uh, bad situation. I didn't like the way the um, individuals being treated. I remember hearing keys jingling, doors locking, big metal locks turning. There was a, a very overwhelming smell of what they call Big D disinfect. And in the day room, there were about 30 males, many of them in diapers, and they were grown men, and I was stunned. There was steam heat in the institution, and I remember these green putrid towel walls that sweated. And when they sweated, I saw roaches literally skiing down the walls. Seeing individuals who were in cribs, even though they were adults, and cribs that had, they really were cages. Forest Haven was an institution for people with intellectual disabilities. It opened in 1925 in Laurel, Maryland, and was run by the D.C. government. In 1976, a federal class action lawsuit was filed against the district, and in 1991, Forest Haven officially shut down. This is a building that is covered in medical records, beer cans from people who have just swung by, and then these cribs that some of them even had the tops on them, so essentially they were staying in cages. Um, we can see over here there are binders and folders filled with records. Filled. Uh, this one has fire drill records, progress reports for Little Harry's individual therapy sessions progress reports from 1973 and this is all here for anybody who wants to come by and grab them. Dr. Muggy Du ran the toilet training program at Forest Haven for years and the things she witnessed remain vivid in her memory today. There was a bathroom and that day that I was there that toilet backed up into the middle of the floor and I saw several young men rush from their benches to eat the feces that came floating out of that bathroom. I saw the staff watching television and they were smoking. It was two female staff with 30 males. Understaffing, lack of training, and overcrowding were the biggest issues at the facility. Hundreds of residents died from aspiration pneumonia, an infection that develops when you inhale food, liquid, or vomit into your lungs. This uh, staff person was operating much too rapidly and feeding people too rapidly, and that's the kind of situation that led to the, um, the aspiration pneumonia. Even with notice and warning that we were coming out to to view what was going on, they didn't manage to staff up and do it properly. And they had control. They knew their names. They even could identify whose diaper was soiled from the smell. The facility itself still stands today and is easily accessible. We walked through a path onto the premises. The doors of all the buildings we entered were unlocked and what looked like a security car casually drove by us in the front of the administration building. The aura of Forest Haven is definitely haunting, and there is evidence of frequent visitors and vandalizers on the premises. But it does pose the thought, is the current state of Forest Haven an extended metaphor of how residents were treated? The fact that nobody's paying attention to it, particularly the fact that there might be personal records that are meant to be confidential and they're still there and lying around, is metaphorical. It's a it's out of sight, out of mind, has always been part of the problem. In 2011, the courts ordered D.C. to allocate funds for proper document handling and facility cleanup because personal medical records are just all over the place in this facility. Now it's 2015 and these documents are still here. Um, as you can see, just piles of them. I can pick up any random document and I get the name of a patient, the task, which toileting, and basically a report card for how to use a toilet. And these are all personal documents with names and grades everywhere. So really, how much money does it take to clean up a facility like this and why is it still here? 
The district spent those thousands of dollars clearing out three buildings, leaving the sites clean of any paper documents. But those are only three buildings of the 22 on campus. And in 2004, an audit proved the lack of management of the property since its closing and found that none of the unused buildings were ever secured and access has remained easy and constant. There was some light amidst the darkness. I remember standing in the middle of that room, overwhelmed, and I was singing under my breath, nobody knows the trouble I see. And do you know that song was answered in song? A song, a gospel song for her. I see. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. And I walked over to him and he introduced himself. He just put his hand out and he said, Hi, I'm Brian. Are you going to be our unit chief? I said, yes, I am going to be the chief here, and I'm going to help you get out of here, and we're going to get you a piano. And he says, oh, that's good. I'm a gospel singer. There he stood in front of me with a T-shirt that had the menu of the day on it. It was disengaged from the collar. He was holding his trousers together because he didn't have a belt. There were four gigantic safety pins in the zipper part. He had on tennis shoes with no ties in them, he had on no socks. The District of Columbia was the second jurisdiction to deinstitutionalize in 1991 when the facility closed down. But institutions were frequently used decades before, and in the early 70s, a nearby orphanage called Junior Village shut down, and 20 of the orphans were relocated to Forest Haven even when they didn't have disabilities. Institutions became places where people with a variety of different challenges got placed because they didn't have anywhere else to put people, uh, and they weren't seen as uh, people with any potential in the world. Forest Haven was a last resort for me. It was a court proceeding, and the judge hit the gavel, and he announced that he had been committed. I immediately just couldn't see anything. I couldn't see where I was going. They said that I could stay with them until they were ready to go, but it was just a swelling up in here. There was no way I could have stayed, and I said, I got to get out of here, and it was 30 days before I could see him again. Well, it definitely was mistreatment. I cannot deny that. And it is horrendous. The individuals got hit with belts, switches, baseball bats and everything. You name it. I also saw great acts of love and sacrifice on the parts of the staff. When they didn't have money to buy the client's shoes, they went into their own pockets and bought tennis shoes, they bought Easter dresses. They took them home for Christmas dinner. I did witness the staff uh, being inappropriate. They were drinking on duty. A staff person uh, taking a hose and giving them all a shower. I saw another staff person take one toothbrush and try to brush the teeth of several people. And that was stopped. And as a result, the tires of my car were slashed. Uh, sugar was put in my tank. I had super glued, the, they super glued the lock to my office. And I told the staff, all the, all the good work she's doing, y'all don't like her? They said, no, Mr. Sloan, we don't, we don't like her. And I told the staff, I said, well, I'm gonna tell you something. God, God is looking down on each, and, on each and one of you. And God is gonna punish God is going to punish all the staff. I always managed to go by myself. That's the way I wanted it. I would ride out to the end or just near the gate of Forest Haven, and I'd sit and cry. And when I got through, then I'd dry my face off and I'd put the windows down and drive home. Brian lived in Forest Haven from the ages of 10 to 30 and only went home on some holidays. But regardless of his living conditions, his passion for the arts constantly grew. And I was fascinated with the fact that he had 
such a sense of self in such a horrible place. It's just one huge miracle. That is what Brian is. Yeah. He's just a miracle. When did you notice Brian's artistic abilities and his singing voice? Brian was playing this keyboard that we got him for Christmas, and he was playing this tune that he had heard on one of the recordings. And then after that, anything that he heard that he liked, he would play it out on this little piano. And uh, that piano stayed in our lives a very long time. <laughs> I always hear good gospel music. I picked it right up on the piano, just like, just like that. In my head, that's what got me out of it, and that's what got me through it. Brian also had his fair share of darker days during those 20 years. He, he would fight in a minute. If you can imagine a, a blind person fighting, but, and he was very verbally uh, abusive uh, to other people. Um, and, and it was like a protective type thing. And you more or less could sense that something was wrong or something wasn't going quite right. Well, the reason why I was a little upset because they did not want me to use the washing machine to do my laundry. I have dirty underwear, dirty underclothes on. It was filthy, dirty. Did you ever speak up about what was happening at Forest Haven? Oh, I spoke up. I spoke up. I went on Channel 9 News in 1981 and reported it. And I told Bruce Johnson what happened. They hit you? The residents? Huh? Yeah, they hit all the residents and everything else. They're going to hit them with a mop out and all that. No. Who hits them? What two do the staff? And they tell because I'm leaving. The staff hits him? Yeah. The staff is jealous because you're leaving? Yeah, 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 I told him, yeah. I said, well, I gotta leave sometimes, no. And I've been out here for a long time. He said, Brian Slaughter, why in the hell did you toll on me? I said, I, and I told him, I don't know, because the reason why I did it, because y'all treat these individuals wrong. And when I went to the service building and ate, ate my lunch, I got my trade taken. I got my food taken away. I got my clothes packed. Got ready to move into the group home. And I told Force Hidden bye bye. I told Force Hidden goodbye. I ain't, I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not gonna see you no more. Goodbye. These folks deserve a better place than this. They're just getting the crumbs of the table of life. And giving them a better place became Dr. Dew's ultimate goal as she opened the Art and Drama Therapy Institute over 20 years ago to help folks with intellectual disabilities use and express their talents in the arts. I, I just I admire what Dr. Dew and, and uh, them do there. They, they just make them feel so much a part of, of life yeah. and everything. As a matter of fact, they just give everybody a life there. And it's, it's just amazing. It's clear that Brian has found more haven here at the Art and Drama Therapy Institute than he ever did at Forest Haven. He now has a full-time job as a music assistant instructor and will be performing at their biggest annual event of the year with a couple of solos. Brian has moved on, but now almost 40 years later, though hundreds of the class members have passed away, the Evans case is still open and the litigation has lived on. My first task as I took over the case was to complete the deinstitutionalization de process. And uh, I set about as quickly as I could filing a motion to hold the government in contempt for not meeting the, the requirements of those orders to close the place down. Joy Evans was a resident at Forest Haven whose parents led the suit. Unfortunately, Joy died early in the process at the age of 17. The cause of death? Aspiration pneumonia. The saddest part of listening to that story it was listening to Mrs. Evans talk about she had no other option. But the fact that she did remain connected with Joy um, really ultimately was a benefit to everybody who lived at Forest Haven because she then became the fighter that stood up for the injustice that Joy and everyone like her faced. The name plaintiff's parents, Harold and Betty Evans, who were just heroic 
from day one, and they did what a lot of people wouldn't do, which is they found a lawyer and they became activists and they organized, and tragically their daughter died early in the process, and they kept at it for decades after that. In 2002, Quality Trust for Individuals with Disabilities was formed as a part of a settlement in the case. I reached out to both the current and former defense attorneys on the Evans case, but both declined to speak because it is still open. So much has happened since its initiation in 1976, including the formation of the Olmstead or the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1999 that requires states to place people with disabilities in community settings rather than institutions. This constant change of attitude and systems is a big reason the case remains in litigation, but it is no secret that hundreds of the class members are getting older and have already passed away. Meanwhile, the months of rehearsal at Art and Drama are about to pay off for their biggest show of the year. Right now, Brian and his friends, including a few other former Forest Haven residents, are backstage preparing for their 10th annual concert here at the Lincoln Theater. This is also their third time earning a submission for a Grammy nomination in the category of R&B, single, and brand new artist. <laughs> To see all of them perform as well as they do and from where they came. Amazing. And we know what, you know, we say for our saving was. And for them to be doing this now and coming from that, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. Everyone has talent. So to see Dr. Dew and the crew be able to pull this talent together for them to perform there, it takes a lot of courage. It just takes a lot of everything, and it was enjoyable. I mean, I just love it, yeah. How have you seen uh, Brian progress from when he was at Forest Haven until now? Oh, the, the change is tremendous. I mean, the growth is tremendous. He was a child. Yeah, he was a child then, but the growth is tremendous. Just his, his courage, just his um, confidence in himself, his love of music, him able to express himself. I mean, it's just incredible. There you go. Mama's in the back, you want to go see her? Yes. Yeah. yeah, Brian, you were amazing. Hold on, we're uh, oh, no, old. No, we're old. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. We're here and all these things fall up. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. You were really, really good there tonight. Oh, that's that was excellent. Oh, my goodness. I loved that piece of steel. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. You know that's my favorite. That was one of the most sincere performances I've ever seen. There were tears, laughs, several standing ovations, and oftentimes the intellectually disabled community is neglected in our society, but this just goes to show that when you give them this platform to express themselves and their talents and passions, especially in the arts, essentially what you get is magic. As for Brian, he went from Forest Haven to being a world-renowned gospel singer. But I also think it's important to note that not everyone who was at Forest Haven got Brian's opportunities. Several of them are still waiting for justice today.